Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's episode. So, to start off, the title of tonight's episode, Birth of Raging Truth at Death. It's a very important idea. It has to do with a sort of backup uh, system of intelligence to the human being once its ordered realities are instantaneously thrown into chaos. Or it could be the other way around as well where a sort of chaotic attachment to the world has to let go of itself as well. You see, it's not just order that suddenly chaos invades. Sometimes order invades chaos. This sort of uh, the rage of the origin of an intelligence, pretty much its endurance till the end of its time, there's a significance to it. There's a significance, and this is a theme where it was not early on introduced to me. It was later on introduced to me through indirect ways. But it was this theme, like, uh, I'll say, I'll, say it, I'll, I'll tell you the direct ways it was actually... Um, there's a quote from Dylan Thomas where it's this magnificent poet he has written for his father as he's passed as his father's passing away. And there's a line in that poem, the last two lines, where it's something like Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage. Rage. Rage against the dying of the light. Now that's a very significant thing, because we have a sort of animalistic nature, once we are cornered, we in some sense rage. There is a sort of kind of backup system of intensity that finds the evolutionary creature when it is denied a sort of uh, evolutionary access. You see, we became conscious. When we became conscious, the game of the world changed a little bit. The game before was kind of like nature's unconscious movement, and then when consciousness arose, this was for the first time how something in this world was, uh, how can I tell you, it's as if the brains, this, uh, <clears throat> because the brain in some sense was a sort of extent separation of matter from the overall matter, uh, it began experiencing different speeds of change.
Let me see if I can paint a bit better picture. We are creatures that, in some sense, value continuity. Evolution can be said to be a sort of strange eternal urge for an existential phenomena to continue consciously with change. I find that when the end of any sort of process comes, uh, truth has a sort of final stance. What that means is it's like when the thief is in some sense being caught, it will try to, in some sense, uh, <clears throat> steal the biggest thing. I'm not really sure kind of like how to communicate it. What, it's strange tonight, this thing I want to explain, because it has to death, it, has to, it, it kind of requires me to kind of explain a sort of approach to non-existence. And the only approach that human beings have to non-existence is to studying existence. Uh, what that means is when you study what you know, you suddenly see what you don't know. What you don't know, for most people, it, it terrifies them. But for the mystic, in some sense, it is where the road begins. <clears throat> and so, when a person is confronted by the unknown and the forces, and pretty much what is happening in the moment is too unknown for them, they, in some sense, their ego submits to the environment. The ego takes the shape of the environment. You know, where they, there's this saying that says where, the, where there's a will, there's a way. This will has to do with an attention beyond the resistance that is being found in the moment.
I am reminded of this uh, very incredible work of Japanese storytelling. It's this anime show called Attack on Titan. And there's very incredible personalities, even though it's a show, like an anime show. But the character development is incredible. And if the mind of the viewer could consider the realness of that character, like try to imagine if they were in that in the shoes of that character, how the experience of life would be, suddenly it's like you see the magnificence of the design of um, the characters in Attack on Titan. Anyways, uh, there's this um, <clears throat> sort of moment where this general, this commander, his name is Commander Erevin. They're in a situation where they have to find, fight these kind of like brainless, uh, let's say these, these kind of like giant creatures that kind of like look human and eat them. Pretty much it's an extinction situation and humanity's last stance is kind of like a moment where this commander realizes all the good soldiers have died and it's only the new recruits that are there. And so he realizes that the new recruits are kind of being left to die, right? And this man is so such a strategic general that it's as if he, t he changes his disadvantage into an advantage <clears throat> by using his disadvantage as a distraction. So anyways, what this character does is he has to inspire these kind of torn and hopeless soldiers in their last stance before they all die. And so this general just goes up there instantly and just shouts. It's as if he doesn't care for anybody's emotions. He's just giving a command. And this commander goes, <clears throat> and it's that moment where you see like a sort of, uh, the commander is trying to inf inspire the forces. And he says, he calls all the uh, all the scouts uh, in the show, all the soldiers, and he says, soldiers, this is your final operation, something like that. And then all the soldiers are listening. And he says, we are all going to charge at the enemy, and we're going to use, they have these, um, I forget what they're called, um, these smoke kind of guns, I forget the term. <clears throat> Anyways, what happens is, then one of the soldiers suddenly, as uh, the commander says, we're going to all be a distraction. So this one soldier kills the main bad guy or whatever, you know. And so the situation is one soldier, all the soldiers are terrified. They're all going to their death. And the show, the show does an incredible job to show the kind of what is occurring in the minds of the characters before they die, right? The show has an incredible ability to present that. Anyways. Commander Erevin suddenly is challenged by one of the soldiers. One of the, All the soldiers are terrified because they have to march at these giants and they're all going to die. And, he, and the soldier says, Commander, like, are you saying that we will all die right now? Are we run, going to our deaths? <clears throat> and the commander's like, yes. And then the soldiers, and the commander tells them something also. The commander tell, um uh, tells them that uh, the commander is kind of like he's there's no sense of fear in him he's kind of, in in the show he just says he gives very direct answers and uh, the guy says do you, are we going to our deaths he said yes and uh, the soldier says so you are saying even though we're all going to die we should at least fight and then this commander Erwin goes into one of the most profound speeches and they are in a very cruel extinction scenario, these characters. And Commander Erwin says this very profound thing. He says, um, he says, the only thing you can do to a cruel world is rebel. And suddenly all the soldiers, instead of thinking as if they're fighting an enemy, they suddenly realize their inspiration is to have a last stance to their existential condition. It's as if the world is cruel. There is suffering, pain, death, and much, you know, destruction. 
But in this, in this, there is the consciousness of the being, and the consciousness of the being is the last rebellion. It is that thing from the inanimate forces of, not inanimate, but in the unknown, from the unknown suddenly dared open its eyes as man. <clears throat> so this commander, Erebin, unleashes a sort of inspiration in all his soldiers who are eventually all going to die even if they don't fight and he tells them that you must fight you must fight because it is a sort of rebellion against the conditions of nature as if the purpose of the free will is to stand its ground to exist you see it's not that we're just all trying to survive physically the world is no longer just a physical place when creatures began speaking Now, it's not that just we need physical survival, the person also requires social survival because life is kind of society and civilization is divided in these various games that lead the person. It's as if like a solo journey suddenly with a good attitude becomes a, a, a kind of like collective journey of some sorts. But pretty much what I'm trying to say is this commander Erevin, he was in a situation where it was the rage or how can I say, a sort of birth of a raging truth. <clears throat> that means truth was saw its end and remembered the intensity and immensity and the value of its beginning. You see, this is kind of how this existential human condition is designed. We are designed to be creatures that are, have a sort of uh, existential value. As the person gets old, not only their abilities kind of reduce, their energy levels reduce, their physical body changes, it's the stretch of conscious memory. There has been times that's something I realize about the world. Sometimes when you go too, when you jump too quickly into mysticism, you feel you are superior to the material universe. Because you feel you're superior to the material universe, you don't realize you have indirectly kind of chained yourself to the lesser version of the world. You know, it, it, what I mean by that is like, it's a sort of insecurity because the unknown can push the whole system into nihilism. There are, there are two kinds of traps in this reality. Let me tell you what they are. Uh, one is the nihilistic trap, which means concluding that the extremeness of absence and emptiness is the fine finale. And then there is the opposite, where it's the infinitude of the fullness of the intelligence of the world. So for me, it's kind of like, I was like, wait a minute. It's as if we have two brain hemispheres, you know. <clears throat> and even though there's a lot of frontal lobe activity, but these two brain hemispheres imply two modes of reception. It's as if our brains are an intersection of uh, the free and the unfree, the real and the unreal. We're oscillating, we're vibrating between the real and the unreal. Literally our attention, every moment we blink, suddenly, oh my God, where did everything go? <laughs> and then we suddenly, a millisecond later, like our eyes are open. For me, this was the thing. Sometimes when you really want to be something else, you miss out on what you have. This is a cost of truth and living for civilization. It's not a cost, but it's like I'm telling you, these Mr. Within Talks, um, they are for those who have lived enough for themselves. It's as if lifetime after lifetime, you know, Various moments, the person constantly attributed all values to self, 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 self. What should I do? What should I kind of buy? What should I kind of make? What should I be? All these, all these notions. And in some sense, the human being is playing a kind of costume game with the future. We are dressing up the intentions of the world differently based on our energetic levels. <clears throat> You can say the birth of raging truth at death 
is a sort of kind of like you can say metamorphosis where this kind of caterpillar this creature with many legs with many multi-dimensional qualities in some sense goes enters a cocoon it renounces the life of a caterpillar and as the cells of the caterpillar die and they you know in some sense uh kind of break down eventually we see that as the last cell of the caterpillar is broken suddenly it's as if a new system the cells of the butterfly emerge so for me i'm like wait a minute what is this like you know i have looked at many insects <clears throat> in nature and i have thought that if we magnified these insects they would look like aliens to us And the reason I'm saying this is because the caterpillar transforms in a very short period. And that's a very unique thing. Usually we're under the impression that it takes millions of years for there to be a gradual subtle change. For, for a creature to suddenly transform. But creatures of lesser, as if they don't have brains as sophisticated as us, but the caterpillar somehow transforms into a butterfly. It shifts its being. Do you see? It kind of steps out of the eyes of the caterpillar to, in some sense, be the emergence of the eyes of the butterfly. I find our minds have a playful relationship similar to this. The mind of the per person can change sooner than actually the physical body of the person. Do you see? There have been nights where I have looked at my destiny and I have seen, in some sense, a, a sort of glowing ash. And there has been times where I have looked at my kind of like the, 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 my future and I've been like my fate, my, like where all this is heading and my mind could not see an end. This mind has been such a grand performer that the moment I realized I am not my mind was the moment where la the shackles of language and belief kind of broke. The hardest thing to do is to learn from your own mistakes. It's very easy to learn from the mistakes of others because, <laughs> because you haven't made it yet. So you're like, oh shit, something can happen like that. Maybe I should avoid it. You know? But to learn from your own mistakes means you have to see how one reality of function was inefficient in comparison to what can be. Some people are like, man, why do I fail? The person is kind of still uh, sad about failure. The thing is, you should think, why have I not failed yet? That in, in that attitude, it gives you strength. When the past, for most people, because they don't care for the world, the past, their past is a burden for them. But example, for example, if we were in Japanese culture or, you know, kind of like tr very Native American culture, you know, you know, let's say even Cherokee communities and whatnot, we, we would see or the relationship and the value of the ancestors would be very profound. Many people thought that when Columbus and his what what he kinda unleashed, people thought that was like progress coming to the world, right? But it's very fascinating from one angle, you know, to the European colonies or whatnot. It was a success to the other side. It was a defeat. That's the fascinating thing. Leo Tolstoy, this incredible Russian writer and philosopher, he, he's written a lot, he's, he's observed a lot of like what it means, what power and war means. And so, in one of his works where I can't remember, I think it's a sort of letter he's writing. Leo Tolstoy begins to talk about how it's as if the Russian king is saying God is with us. And we are doing, we are going God's direction and the Japanese kind of leaders are also doing something similar. And so what it is, is it is a centering of the world to one's own truths because it's easier than studying the other. 
studying the other is very challenging because every person wants to be secure. What if I told you the thought you have of yourself cannot be you because these thoughts endlessly come and go in the lifetime? So it's as if in a dynamic change, it's very hard to be still. This is why meditation at its core was a very pure stillness and silence. This stillness and silence was so pure, its purity was beyond the subjective realm. It was beyond the language threshold. It was the directness of how experience and existence are this, this, the simultaneous presence of the moment. You see, for me, it's as if the ideas of multidimensionality, they don't have meaning for you. They're t they tend to be left in the experience of imagination, right? But the thing is, what we call imagination and what we call memory are generations uh, that occur momentarily. There has been days I have looked at the sky and what I've seen behind the clouds was not a planet, was not in some sense other solar systems, galaxies. What I saw beyond the clouds was my own mind. And that's a very profound thing because true spirituality has to do with in some sense how the world is in a spiritual state. This spiritual state is the implication of a sort of multidimensionality where all the findings of one dimension cannot possibly be accurate because there's, uh, the, the current dimension is rooted in many others. There's ways that this world could be present right now that as hard as our knowledge streams try, the educational, it doesn't matter how many geniuses are born, it's like the language has not evolved. The concepts do not exist. <clears throat> the beautiful thing about nature is that uh, this is something that became very, uh, I suddenly noticed it very clearly from Vedanta and Vedic texts, uh, such as the Upanishads and the uh, other texts, such as the Ribu Gita, Vaduta Gita, Shtavakra Gita. These are, these are very unique books. They're books that are not, they're like some, some people write books for individuals. Like right now I am speaking, I'm speaking like I, I tend to try to speak in a universal context. <clears throat> you might not believe it, guys. I've recorded a lot of these talks, maybe a time one fifth of them I've uploaded, but I've also lost a lot of these talks. Literally, they've been lost to time due to my ignorance or some sort of unique circumstance. But the situation is I'm telling you, I suddenly... It's like when you lose something of value, what you really understand is you never had it from the first place. The reason many people, I find that after they break up from a relationship, there's this kind of like emotional vacuum. This emotional vacuum is that they felt in their involvement with another living uh, being they were experiencing the greater like the the like something beyond themselves we all human beings are fascinated by what is beyond them it doesn't matter if it has a if you're using re uh, religious glasses you're looking through religious glasses or scientific glasses or whatever ideology you like to color the moment with the thing is is is, is all being carried by attention when you study your attention you become a totally different being because your attention has nothing to do with language. Language moves in your attention. Your attention is like the empty space that holds all phenomena, but it is thought to be empty. <clears throat> it's very unique. In ancient traditions, before the periodic table, the world was a much more simpler place, but in its simplicity, it was also the birth of uh, the first attempts at, uh, at complex modes. So anyways, they acknowledged uh, before the periodic table kind of five elements. 
Now, some cultures acknowledge only four, some acknowledge five. But the fifth element was very crucial. The four elements were earth, air, fire, water. These were not just elements on an external level. They were also the ways that imagination moved. That means that when the person got angry, it was as if they were in, they were the, they were the element of fire was within them. You see? When the person was calm, it's as if uh, <clears throat> they were in some sense in the water or whatever, like various things. But the thing was the fifth element, so earth, air, fire, water, four, the fifth element was ether, ether. This ether was very profound, very profound, because unlike the four elements which were unconscious just designs, the, this fifth element was conscious space. So it's as if there is... Uh, unconscious stuff in conscious space so kind of like that relationship as if the four elements are being watched something is witnessing something and this is why we say there's intelligence here you have to kind of unbox your mind you got to be you got to have like the same dexterity that uh you know let's say Ben's engineer who's designing the new version of the car is kind of has uh, in regards to reverse engineering your own conceptual establishment you see we see we find especially um, I mean I'm still studying I'm trying to truly comprehend the nature of the feminist movement just like any movement it the mo any movement ha involves people, different people, and because there's different people, there can never be a cons consistency of the same level of communication. What that means is, like, the guy is angry from before, suddenly someone does something wrong in a small way, and the guy releases his anger on that small thing. And uh, we kind of see it's like sometimes people's behaviors is not in the present moment. They're not just re reacting or responding to the stimulus of what's happening in the environment only. They have inner environments. When you realize people have inner environments, you're like, oh my God, <clears throat> respect was not you respect another person's body. You respect another living phenomenon's mental field their mind and that's the thing you see this is the thing and it's a very complicated situation right now because it's as if like on one level culture is taking baby steps on another level it doesn't have time to take baby steps like our the, the global civil uh, perspective civilizations inspiration there in some sense here's the idea ladies and gentlemen we are a bunch of creatures on a rock and we all have different ways we're looking at this one world. Yet, we are reaching a point where the modern morality, no, it, it, it becomes modern in its recognition of not the dismissal of the past, but in the allowance of the future. What that means is you... Most people, when they take away something from them, they feel they have to take something back until that feeling goes away. Sometimes it is so easy to manipulate someone, and I see this. I see this happening in society, and it breaks my heart. There's been many moments I've seen human beings in front of me behave in ways where I'm like, uh, it's as if I felt I was in a forest. I felt like that human being was behaving at, with the same level of intelligence and kind of obsession in the moment. Um, it was as if like you become an animal when your free will is chained to conditions that the past is, was forcing you to keep. There is a very unique way of attaining a sort of ultimate freedom. Yeah, and the Zen approach was very incredible. Zen is very, like, I think all comedians in the world should study Zen. Just, just, just get a sense of what some people from that field have said. 
<laughs> it's very funny. When you try to save the world, you have to free the world actually from yourself. And when you try to free yourself, you have to free yourself from the world. Or in some sense, the world has to free you from itself. I find death to be a very unique point. Death is like, uh, I mean, I'm speaking too casually about it. But, <laughs> but I feel this, this the, like a moment will come where the human being will look at this life and will in some sense in one instant remember where it has all come. In that moment, when the physical body is choosing to lift off, that means the physical aspect of your existence, your atoms, are no longer being orchestrated in the unique design that they are now. So what that means is the physical position begins to kind of evaporate. As the physical position begins to evaporate, then comes the, in some sense, afterlife question, where in the afterlife question, it's all about the personality of the intelligence of the moment and whether that continues or not. There have been times where I, I have seen the moment when I was younger, I would see it kind of like mind, body, soul, right? Whenever it was as if first there was soul and body, when the body moved uh, and it became conscious that it moved, it seemed suddenly the soul had imbued itself with a mind. <clears throat> this whole thing I say soul, I mean, another way of saying soul is the unknown. The body is the known. The world is a story, believe it or not. It has to be. I find intelligence, uh, intellect, in, 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 on an, if you want to, see if, if like human beings were wondering, okay, what, what is in, an intellectual approach? They would see the intellectual approach has to do with per, uh, precision and abidance. You see, uh, it's as if cis technology, it is all about the use of technology. When language becomes a technology for you, then uh, uh, Mr. Within will in some sense uh, give you a high fi hypothetical high five. <laughs> what I mean by that is that the nature of the fields of intelligence that are present, trust me, some people... What if I told you there was a, like, just like how in this life we see individual uh, entities evolve, imagine we saw a collective entity, a collective being. We say, okay, existence may, it's like we see there's night and day, so we, we see there's individual creatures and we wonder if there's collective beings. And a collective being is kind of like you can say it is either made up of smaller beings or in some sense, this sort of collective being. Is its own phenomena. So, so let me see. Okay, let me explain like this. Just keep in mind the, these two words collective beings. Okay, collective a collective being. Okay. One version we can see a collective being. This was one where I noticed early on and it fascinated me when I suddenly saw life through this perspective where I saw it was as if an ideology was the first collective being. You see, all our collectivity as creatures has to do with the ideas that we accept, where we choose our attention to remain. So language, imagine like 
hundreds of people following one ideology, guess what? That ideology is a collective being. It is living in multiple locations at the same time. It is existing as the many. Kind of like your palm is a collective being, your fingers are individual beings. Your fingers are, inter are connected to the palm. So in some sense, the ideology is very connected to how the individuals in that field of ideology behave. So one, one, one example of a collective being is a thought, is an ideology. Another example of a collective being is abidance to, with a movement. You see, this was something where if, if it's misused, it will lead to tyranny. If it's uh, used well, it will, in some sense, lead to a sky city. And a sky city is the implication of a sort of paradise. That means no longer the cities of man are, 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 are limited to the conditions of the earth, as if an earthquake will no longer bother the town floating in the air. So think of a surfer riding a wave. That wave is like a collective being. Bunch of surfers riding the same way. You know? So a collective being in a static mode of consideration can be seen as a thought in a uh, kind of collective dynamic mode. It can be seen as a movement. As if imagine many rivers coming to the same river. For me, it's all about design. When I give these talks, it's kind of like it's the same experience for me as when I draw. It's as if the silence is the empty page and every word is just kind of the, the, the type of line that is drawn, the kind of how the canvas is transformed into a profound memory. Because that's what art is. Art was, was the attempt, the freeing the, of the imagination of the conditions of the past. This is, by the way, why Picasso got extremely famous. When you look at a Picasso painting, you're like, oh my God, my little five-year-old cousin can draw that. <laughs> but you see what Picasso was doing was more magnificent because Picasso's genius was in some sense in his ability to see the cultural transition. And so before Picasso, there were many strict paintings. There wasn't a sort of fluidity. There wasn't a freedom to be silly, you know. Certain Eastern cultures have this down well. I don't see it really being trend, uh, shared in, the, in, a, in Western secular societies. But it is the notion of rather than banishing the odd, you remind the odd that it is even. What I mean by that is that I w like when I go to downtown Toronto, for, you know, in some sense for work, Oh, man. Sometimes I want to say something, but too, the thoughts move too quick before I can say. <coughs> Pretty much language. As a, in a personal way, should be considered a technology in an impersonal way, should be considered as nature's mind. 
You might not believe this, dear listener, because it is uncommon to say. But truth, that word, truth, what it can possibly, when we just look at, look at the design of truth, of that idea of that symbol, we see it is a revelation pretty much how the unknown is no longer unknown. And that is the purpose of free will. Your mind, whether it doesn't matter what, what, what state your physical body is, your mind is a wave, a kind of movement. It's a, it's a sort of burst, a sort of burst, your attention in your waking state it ha it's an emin like imagine like a candle, uh, like the light of a candle, you know. There's a, you um, a term they say candela. A unit of measurement, where pretty much it's like I thought I know like how the guy came up with the term candela. Like the dude had a candle in a dark room, and he's like, okay, one candela. <laughs> But anyways, the light of the candle is the burning expression of conscious existence. Every day I wake up and I live this life and I go to sleep, the next day I wake up, something has changed. As if some, it's strange, but time times begins taking things away from you, you know. And some people try to ride the wave, what we all have to consider old age. And what that means is, it, rather than people just trying to save themselves, we have to change the system so it becomes easier to even save ourselves. That means we, are, we it's like Mr. Within is looking at the egos of the good and evil people on this planet. It's as if I don't care what kind of action you as a human being define yourself by. You know, for me it's not important how your attention chooses to freely move on this planet. You could do whatever you like. But I'm saying, I'm saying one thing we have to do is, which doesn't intervene on your free will, but is a request, is a request of the attention of the human being. And Mr. Within is saying one-fifth of your lifetime live for your civilization, for its advancement. Just do one thing. Not just one thing, but you know what I mean, one-fifth of your lifetime. That means one-fifth of every day, do something for your civilization. You know, it's as if uh, fathers on this planet should be passing, like on their deathbed when their sons and daughters are there, the father should be like my son and daughter, you know, let's say his wife is there too. And he says, oh, future generations, here is my library. You see what I mean? We, we become responsible in trying to externalize the inner realities of who we truly are to see to see if there can be efficiency found in honesty. You see, it's like I'm not, <clears throat> I feel like you can't, you know, heaven is boring. Because in some sense, there is no longer a cost to living. There is no mistake that can be made. It's as if some, there was, I don't remember who the person was, but I remember reading this quote online where it was a very profound quote. And the quote was like, the difference between angels and man is that angels have no free will. They are just the pure expression of uh, God's truth, God's command. The angel doesn't have free will and this is why it is untouched by the mortal realm. This is why, in, like, in, 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 when we look at kind of like the, 
background imagery of the ideology of many uh, of the of the Abrahamic religions. It's as if the revelation came through a sort of angelic structure, as if it's the people looked at the sky and suddenly something came from it. And imagine like an alien coming down to Earth in, on, this, on the 6th century and people are like, oh my God, what technology is this alien going to give us? But this alien, instead of giving a technology like a kind of advanced machine or science, what this, uh, in some sense, not science because science doesn't exist in some sense. So. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> what I'm saying is... Uh, that alien gave us depth. Religion is depth. It is very strange, unique, out of nowhere. It's as if, like, when I see religious ideology, I don't, it's not like, I, it's like you, there's no need to love or hate something that you cannot fully see. This is why it's very hard for me to hate and love people. And some people say, why? And then you know what I tell them? I tell them because who I see is not all of who I see. That means as I'm speaking right now, I don't have your eyes. And you don't have my eyes. Yet the words somehow relay and your mind animates it based on how it welcomes it. I have said in other talks, language is a bridge between inner dimensions. This is why children must be taught how to communicate or they would not, they would live a lifetime where they have enclosed themselves behind their eyes. <clears throat> Do you know how many people are artificially living in society? It doesn't matter how wealthy they are. It doesn't matter how unwealthy they are. It, it, it's, it's just an artificialness. This artificialness is very kind of hollow. It's as if the same artificialness you will find if you suddenly found yourself in a world of clones. You know, it's like there's a hollowness because the true nature is not being respected. And you can only find your true nature if you find the truth of nature and where it arises and where it is received. Somebody came to Kabir, this enlightened kind of illiterate sage in India. And it's like, Kabir, how long does it take for me to get enlightened? And Kabir looked at the man and said half of a half of an instant. Kabir has this other saying where he says, Kabir <clears throat> has the saying where he says, student, tell me what is God? And the student responds, it is the breath inside the breath, which means I, have, I am beyond the language threshold. And that is the true sign of clarity on the surface of this rock that we don't lie to ourselves. That's where, that's where life begins, when you stop lying to yourself. Sometimes lying to yourself could be just how your attention is caught in the past, how you're living every day, but something from the past is lingering, as if you have access to the data of a new day, but also the thought that kind of was echoing in the back of your mind. Another notion of a collective being can be found in uh, Attar's. Attar is this uh, ancient Persian poet, like, I don't know, 900 years ago or something, uh, in a town called Neshapur. And 
Atar, he has this uh, incredible book, like poetic, like incredible work of literature. I feel it should be studied in all universities. It's called the Conference of the Birds, and he has the story where all the birds in the world gather around to find the ultimate bird, which is known as the phoenix. These birds are looking for the ultimate truth, the, the ultimate, they're looking pretty much for God, the God bird, and so the phoenix. And so in some sense, in that moment, All these birds, as they fly together, eventually in the journey, a majority, all like the birds, so many of the birds become hopeless. They're like, there's no God. You know, they say God is dead. There's no phoenix. The phoenix is dead. There's no such thing as a phoenix. They're doubting the potentials of the reality. And so they stop, stop flying. And so this, all the birds, like imagine how much birds in the sky, suddenly one by one, they start uh, stop flying. And at the end of it, very strangely, 30 birds, 30, specifically 30 birds remain. And these 30 birds have this endless endurance. That means they just want to know they are just like naturally, naturally as beings, they're like, okay, if there is something more, why, why the dismissal of it? If there is 0, 0.0, whatever amount of zeros you want, 1% chance that this reality, this moment is more multidimensional than our conceptual power as a species. If it is beyond the scope of our language and educational systems, then how do we approach it? So the world is actually an unknown place. And I, on, on some level, I understand how children are being taught, in some sense. Um, uh, the professors are relaying data in person. Okay, Now, I feel this is an efficient way the educational system and universities are designed personally. And I've pondered this. I pondered when I was in university, I pondered this in some sense. What, what I mean by that is that imagine our species was under attack by, by an alien species or whatever, like we saw in the Ind movie Independence Day. Now imagine this attack continued. <clears throat> Again, like we are seeing the rage of truth at, uh, at a moment of, in some sense, death. So we see this alien attack would automatically make all human leaders forget, just forget about the wars among humans and kind of like the enemy of my enemy of my friend mentality imagine unifies humanity <clears throat> so we are in this moment where we're like holy shit we can't be uh, disgraceful or let's say racist or any sort of ist <laughs> kind of against one another simply because it is a battle between species we are uh, right now all our wars, major wars and catastrophes that are occurring, it's interspecies. It's as if human beings who are more intelligent than all the other animals are kind of like going at it, competing. But the, it, when we see it's suddenly, it, it's not just interspecies. 
and outer species as if our are the the extinction of of our genes uh, as human beings is in danger suddenly human beings will forget their petty games and they will be like oh my god uh, <clears throat> a bigger emergency has arrived not only have we already conceived world peace now we are emerging and in some sense advancing towards this kind of unknown confrontation so the reason i'm saying it like that is because then the edu value of the educational system would be the unknown so what does that mean that means children can, should be taught to some level by a teacher the rest of it should be just uh, exploration and attempts at the hardest problems this world is trying to confront This is why it's as if the, it's, the parent wonders, should I lie to my child or not? And you see... There is not enough time. This is why I feel no human being can ever be satisfied. We see in these soap operas, the, the, guy, the guy is trying to satisfy the girl, buying him things, and then the girl's trying to satisfy the guy and whatnot. And <clears throat> so what happens is in some sense, kind of a dependence of trying to bring a sort of external perfection about as if your mind your desire is hijacking your attention from how every moment is different in its uh, uh, presence and quality and just the fabric of it changes so this commonality of this just w wonder like okay the species right now has to acknowledge that means imagine like there were like <sighs> I'm scoping too ahead but anyways Ooh, how would I say this <laughs> We care for what we know. Usually this is how it goes. All human beings, whatever they're more familiar with, their free will feels more in control of, therefore they feel more comfortable. The species and all human beings, this is a global command, there must arise an ability to see a new dimension. That means literally adding, like any person who understands arithmetic will understand this idea. That we just, we don't want to get rid of something, we just want to add a new way of seeing things. <clears throat> Not to forget the old world and run to some new paradise, uh, and at the same time not to be so held back by the past that we never see what our future could be. There's times where I've walked, like I remember uh, I was living in Birmingham, UK, where I started giving these talks on YouTube. And I, I remember I was walking the streets and it was like nighttime and my mind very, very like downtown Birmingham, it wasn't like it's not a big place, but <laughs> um, my mind began visualizing very playfully these giant white glowing uh, lions just running in the streets giant like sky like huge building size kind of lions and then i realized the ability of nature to shift ideology now i can't this is for another talk but there will be to definitely i'm gonna have like 
uh, I've kind of challenged myself to try to give a 10 hour episode one, one day not as a common thing but like <clears throat> just to explain a broad thing uh, like um, it's like a, a realignment of the value system uh, and you suddenly see what is like if we are creatures let's say data processing creatures sensory data processing creatures okay so what is doing the processing and we have concluded it is the thought of me it is me my name my personality who I am the story but the moment we realize our explanation of the moment is just limited to the subjective domain. This is where, uh, why in some sense, many philosophers feel an anguish in their uh, uh, depth because they are in their ivory tower. This is the problem with the intellect. The moment you think you are different, you already are. The moment you think you are the same, you already are. The instantaneity of the acceptance of the context brings also a simultaneous unconscious acceptance of the context of the situation. The conditions of nature, sometimes they don't care for the inner reality of the person. This makes the world seem cruel because there's suffering. This cruelty is kind of like part of the data. The sensory data is giving you a temporary display of intelligence. This temporary intelligence is like it's so easy to come in terms with death because every night when you sleep, it's as if deep in deep sleep, nobody has problems. Not even, in, there, there's no dream state. So like in deep sleep, like, <laughs> this is why it's like, there, it's so fragile. It's so we have too soon accepted the world into a story. The stories, the purpose of technology is to update, simply said. So what I mean is that it's like when you look at a civilization really slowed down, you ask yourself, okay, why is it slow? Because the values being fed to children is just, it's like there's something, the saying they say, I saw, I heard Elon Musk say it in a video. He said, if they make you ask the wrong question, they don't have to worry about your answers. And just think about that. Where your attention goes is where the type of data you have access to. You march uh, with a sort of honor for your free will. When you honor your free will, streams of, like, you gain strength when you honor your free will. When you dishonor your free will, and you, dis you can dishonor your free will in two ways. <laughs> One way is by believing the external first. And the other way is by not caring for the free will that's here. I, I personally consider maybe like 11% of ex this existence is contained in our language. 
right now. Our language systems is a collective civilized nation. If children are given the most complex problems at an early age, they have more time to think about various ways the idea can affect. And sometimes we wonder, okay, it's like could data overwhelm the person? And this is true, but it's like why, why, why did a lot of people like the movie 300? Because the dude threw his kid into the wilderness and he's like, kill a wolf and then I'll let you come back. Yeah. <laughs> So it's one of those situations where it's like that th uh, being thrown into the chaotic condition is where strength and confrontation kind of builds you as a being, right? So right now when the civilization is in a kind of messed up, like, uh, you know, uh, transition from a sort of animalistic bound unconditional nature to a sort of conditional free will civility, you know? I find that life on this planet, conceptually in regards to the subjective uh, existence of the being, the subjective life of the person can become very chaotic if the person feels there can be such a thing as a normality in a changing world. It's like language is a world in a world. And because it's in a, a world in a world, because the first world is changing, like language is changing as well. How can we deny we are like changing existence? How can, how can thoughts conquer man's world? The issue is not the right or wrongness. Like some people sometimes live life, to, are trying to live moral lives, and I'm like, what the hell is going on? Again, another program of culture. <clears throat> because this is a temporary life, there's certain moments where, like... <laughs> Where in society, I feel there is like, every day happens once, you don't have time to be something else. It's kind of like you, you live with the nature of your design. You not only come into contentment with it, in its utter freedom, chaos and order become, it's as if there, like your external reality is very gentle and efficient your inner reality is where it's like all the external inefficiencies internally are being handled and so where does all this metaphysical mystical discussion lead 
it leads to a notion where I, I have considered it, this is my personal view, of course, but Mr. Within is saying it like this, that I have created a term, I call it the pilot of consciousness. This is a very important term. And I feel I'm kind of like the first human being for the first time relating truly the notion of a pilot, of a, a, a being, like how consciousness is navigating its plane of existence into meaning. And so how attention can move. And how attention is already a movement too. Why do you think they call it self-realization? There's something here prior to the self's kind of conception. It's as if the real eyes of the self is the world. The pilot of consciousness begins to realize experience has a value that in some sense uh, words and Sometimes life can become so peacefully quiet. That thoughts begin not moving because prior to the thought, there is the awareness of how attention is being present. How attention is being present is such an instantaneous moment of how attention is just being, that in this instantaneity of how attention is being, uh, there, there, how can I say it, it's like an empty, in, an empty infinity arises. It's where life suddenly had nowhere to go because nowhere was now here. The letters speak for themselves. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage. Rage against the dying of the light. An experiential life means prior to thoughts uh, occupying the attention of the being throughout the day, the being's attention is going to just the nature of how their experience is happening. And then throughout the day, it's kind of like the data that is revealed and how dynamic you are kind of puts the day into a sort of animation, into some sort of movement of meaning. And society can be said to be a very busy movement like many movements of meaning are kind of moving in the same space like when you wait in an airport what do you see so many people with so many different destinations uh, in the same space and we find that civilization and society because for now it's like there's this sort of scarcity we got and we're still in evolving animals so holy shit people are greedy till the end of time like that mentality is a uh, <laughs> it's it's a good it, it makes sense but it doesn't make sense enough the more dimensions that could become to the awareness of the being the grander we, that the self-inquiry becomes it's like suddenly your mind becomes your teacher so you study and learn from how your, your own intelligence moves prior to giving the ownership of how your intelligence is defined to the external reality. That means no teacher knows you better than you. <laughs> this is the ultimate wisdom.
this is why the greatest teachers are just trying to remind like it, the the student in some sense by giving it a mirror this is why i say that uh, i pretty much uh, give these talks openly because This world is too beautiful to be kept in an illusion. There's so the, the unknown is uh, is the law creator of knowledge. It's the edge of knowledge. <sighs> Anyways, thanks for tuning in. I feel like sharing one more story before I end off. It's the story of these two imperial soldiers, just guards who every day have to stand in front of the palace entrance. These two guards are so professional and have s such a strong will that they're just doing their job every day. One day, one of them in, uh, says to the other, hey, you see that flagpole right there? You see that flag? And the other, the other guard is like, yeah. And the guy's like, it's the flag that's moving, not the wind. And then his friend looks at it and just really looks at it and he's like, no man, it's obviously the wind that's moving the flag. And so they ha they're found in this very unique paradoxical kind of discussion where from both viewpoints it's correct. And suddenly to their surprise, these two guards who are kind of like, imagine like, British palace guards, even though this is kind of like a imperial Zen story, you know. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> these two guards who kind of have just maintained their position, they suddenly see, to their surprise, there's this kind of enlightened sage that never comes out of like the mountains. It's just coincidentally walking down there, you know. And so they suddenly see this wise old sage monk kind of walking on the street and both guards just quickly run to this monk and they say sir please tell us and they explain the situation and they say what which which is it is it the flag that's moving or is it the uh the wind that's moving and this is the true moral of the story right here what the zen master says what the sage says the sage looks at both of them, this old guy, and he says, it's the mind that's moving. And the sage smiles and continues walking. And so these two imperial guards go return and sit at their posts, and they're like, as they're there, and they're suddenly, it sinks in. And they're both are kind of share the same smile as the sage. They begin to realize the value of free will. Sometimes I'll tell you something very hilarious. Uh, when people cannot own something internally, they try to externally own it. And vice versa also applies. Sometimes when they can't own something externally, they try to internally own it. And I've seen this. It's like you see these rappers who uh, have not like kind of entered the entertainment industry, but acting as if they're already billionaires. <laughs> You know, like, <laughs> like, uh, and for me, it's, it's, it's like there's, there's a good approach in regards to confidence and the display of personality, but at the same time, there has to be a consideration of uh, validity of communication. How true are you being in a world that you're in once?
and so the, it is the mind that's moving. There's a story, I think it's ascribed to Zen Master Dogen's childhood. I could, it could be another Zen Master, but uh, it could be Suzuki, but I don't know. It's this kid who was in the Zen monastery, this kind of mis like mischievous kind of enlightened kid. And uh, in this Zen monastery and this Zen master, this kid accidentally breaks like this very ancient kind of relic of laws. And so he's like, oh my God, I've broken like the sacred laws, you know. And so the Zen master in the monastery is kind of walking, walking towards and he, This kid is so smart that he immediately picks up the pieces of the laws. So there's like nothing broken on the ground and he holds it behind him. And he goes up to the master with his hands behind him. And he says to the sage, and he says a very, he asks a very important question. He says, <laughs> it's like the, the, his, like the head, 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 you know, the head Zen master, I don't know <laughs> what the exact, like uh, the sage of the moment. The head of the monastery is walking by and at this kid who's hiding the laws behind him, he says to him, sir. I am very curious and I need to know, what is death? And the sage is shocked, like this like eight-year-old kid is saying, tell me what is death, okay? And uh, the Zen master suddenly very elegantly and profoundly and pr appropriately says something to this kid, which is like this profound, like, you know, enlightening thing, like, uh, I don't know, he says something like death is the movement of time and how change is how this world breathes, you know, like something, I don't know, something like to that depth. And after, uh, I, and the Zen master says, you must accept death and you must become, find contentment and free yourself beyond, you know, the temporal eyes, and something, something like that level. And the kids, like, just listening to this, taking this all in with the broken boss behind his hands. You know, behind his back, you know. <laughs> and so the Zen master suddenly finishes his, like the headmaster finishes his answer. And he says, that was a great question. I'm impressed. And then the kid looks at the Zen master and says, thanks for sharing your wisdom on death. By the way, your vase died. <laughs> and so the Zen master is like, darn it, he's done it again. <laughs> Like some Dennis the Menace show, yeah. But like... <laughs> the whole idea was... Um, awareness. Of the movement of... Various ways the world has been self-classified. It has been classified by a, a sense of self. And if you hold on to that sense of self, it eventually becomes a memory. Anything you hold on is getting pulled by time away. This is why we must live in, uh, not just in the moment, for the moment. <sighs> Much blessings and namaste. Within your attention. The secrets of the universe have never gone anywhere. No, sir.